Omar, I think I'll leave my. Hello, everyone. Um, as you're coming in, please let us know where you're tuning in from. And uh, we'll get started in a minute. Let's see, no, no one in the chat yet. Um, and we're almost to our number. It's actually go, coming, uh, folks are coming in a lot faster than you usually do. <laughs> um, maybe Zoom updated something. Uh, we got some folks from Springfield, uh, Virginia, and East Windsor, probably in Connecticut. Um, East Haddam. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello, I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the Literary Program Coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum here in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm delighted to host tonight's program for A Mystery of Mysteries, The Death and Life of Edgar Allan Poe. First, I need to thank our sponsors. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are happy to honor his memory with these programs. We are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all of our virtual programs. As a nonprofit organization, the Mark Twain House and Museum depends on contributions to share our enriching author programs like A Mystery of Mysteries, education initiatives, and other events with our community. If you can, please consider donating. I'll provide a link for that in the chat, or you can also find it on our website. Now, let me tell you a little bit about tonight's program. Um, we are welcoming Mark Dowidziak and Jordan Costanza for a discussion of Mark's book, A Mystery of Mysteries, which examines Poe's life through the prism of his mysterious death and its many possible causes. Our author, Mark Dowidziak, is the author or editor of 25 books, including three studies of landmark television series, The Columbophile uh, Casebook, the Night Stalker Companion, and Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone, his lighthearted 2017 tribute to Rod Sterling's um, classic anthology series. He also is an internationally recognized Mark Twain scholar, and five of his books are about the iconic American writer. He has been portraying Twain on stage for more than 40 years. No less an authority than Ken Burns has said, nobody gets Mark Twain the way Mark Dewitziak does. Jordan Costanza is a third year PhD student in literary studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her primary research interest is American Gothic literature with an emphasis on Edgar Allan Poe. Her current research examines the relationship between the Gothic and religious mythology, as well as how various American Gothic writers deploy mythographic models as frames through which to explore sex, gender, and violence. We encourage you to have a conversation in the chat while Mark and Jordan are having their conversation. But if you have a specific question, you can post that directly into our Q&A uh, Q section, and you could find that at the bottom center of, of the screen. And you can ask a question at any time. You don't have to wait on, until the Q&A section um, or Q&A part of the program. Um, please also know that you can click on live transcript to see auto captioning of this event. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, I will be putting a link in the chat to purchase a Mystery of Mysteries through our museum store. Your purchase will support our museum and our honored guest. Now, uh, please sit back and enjoy, and I will turn this over to Mark and Jordan. Hi. Okay. Hello, Jordan. It's very nice to see you. It's nice to speak with you today and see everybody that came to listen and join us. How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm here talking about Edgar Allan Poe. How could I be bad? Uh, <laughs> you know, but give me That's a chance to answer. talk about Poe. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. That's a perfect answer. So obviously today we're here to discuss your book, 
uh, A Mystery of Mysteries, The Death and Life of Edgar Allan Poe. So how does this title reflect the particular approach you took in biographizing Poe? And I suppose your overall aim with the book. That's that's really gets to the heart of it right right away, um, the, or the telltale heart of it right away. Um, <laughs> It, the, the, the title, the subtitle is reversed from what you would normally expect it to be. It, it is the death and life of Edgar Allan Poe. And that's for many reasons. It's, it's always for many reasons with Poe. There's just never one simple answer with Poe. So, you know, but, but the main reason is because with most biographies, uh, you start where you would logically start when somebody is born, you start with the birth and, with Poe, the conversation about Poe always seems to start with his death. It always seems to start with the mystery that surrounds how he died. And it's, it's in a reverse because um, the book started out to be, um, the, the publisher wanted a book about Poe's death and, and I was more interested in doing a book about how Poe lived because that's as mysterious as his death. We have no real concept of who the real Edgar Allan Poe was. He is a, a, a literary figure shrouded in mystery, mythology, and misunderstanding. And so one of the things I wanted to do with the book was to sort of rescue Poe, if you will, not that he needs rescuing, that sounds too grandiose, but one of the things I wanted to do was to somewhat reclaim the real writer. This, this book is a writer's book about a writer. And I didn't buy the mythology of Poe. I didn't never bought that whole idea of, 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 of who Poe was. But you do start with his death because Poe po has one of the great literary stage exits of all time. You, you know, there's only, there's three great literary stage exits in, in, in history. There's Moliere, who was an actor as well as a playwright. Moliere, is dying of tuberculosis. He gets through his, his, uh, his last performance. He collapses on stage. They revive him in the wings. They bring him back. He finishes the performance and then goes home and dies. Well, that's a pretty good stage exit right there. Yeah. Then there's you know Mark Twain. Twain predicts he's going to die when Halley's Comet comes back. He's born in 1835 with Halley's Comet. This guy, he, he predicts and he, and, and he pulls it off. He pulls it. Now that's pretty good. But Poe dies under circumstances that reflect his two greatest literary achievements. He invents the modern horror story and he invents the modern detective story. And he dies under circumstances which are truly horrific. They would not be out of place in one of his own horror stories. And he dies under circumstances which is a mystery, not just a mystery, but a double barreled mystery. Mm -hmm. Because we have not only the mystery of how did Poe die, but then we also have the mystery of the missing days before he died. There, there's this, he gets on a steamer in Richmond. He's gonna head north. He's heading back home to New York. He ends up a few days later on the streets of Baltimore, insensible, wearing clothes that were not his own. And no witness ever stepped forward to say, oh, I saw Poe on the steamer. I saw him at the rail or I passed him on the street in Baltimore. There is a complete curtain over these days, these missing days. So Poe's sta literary stage exit is even better. It's almost like some PR person stepped in and said, let's have you die at 40. <laughs> Not to only die at 40, but die under circumstances which are going to reflect the, the, the fiction for which you're going to be best known. Well, how good is that? How, how really good is that? So that's why the, the title is, is reversed. And also because... You, you notice I give long-winded answers, by the way. Jump in at any point you want to. <laughs> no, stop. I love it. Okay, is also because um, when Poe died, uh, he he dies on a Sunday. He dies October seventh, eighteen forty-nine. He's buried the next day in a small Presbyterian cemetery in Baltimore. Miserable affair, attended by very few people on a very cold, windswept day. Very, very fitting Poe. He he dies, and then the next day, Tuesday. He dies, he's buried again, because this time a fellow by the name of Rufus Griswold writes the first obituary of him, which appears in the New York Tribune. And the, the obituary starts, Edgar Allan Poe died the day before yesterday in Baltimore. Many will be surprised to learn this, few will be grieved. 
and it went downhill from there mm -hmm. because Griswold was nursing grudges against Poe. Poe selected him to be his literary executor. He trusted him. And so right from the start, Poe gets buried yet again. Mm -hmm. you know, then they dug him up. They dug him up in the, in the 1870s to put him in another place in the cemetery because they wanted to put a monument there and there wasn't room where he was originally put. So they buried him again. They, so this guy, he just keeps getting buried and he's going to escape it. That's the wonderful thing about Poe. Poe, there's a line in, in, in um, The Pit and the Pendulum where the narrator says, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but he says, um, no, not even in the grave is all lost. That's Poe. He's going to escape the death and he's going to become the most alive American writer in the world. Mm -hmm. And there really isn't a second choice. <laughs> For those, if, as much as all you can see how much I love Mark Twain, um, <laughs> Poe, he, he is, I think he's better read in America and I certainly think he's better read around the world. And mm -hmm. so Poe's gonna have the last laugh. Uh, he's going to, to escape the, the death and that's why the reverse, the death and life of Edgar Allan Poe. I love that. So uh, you're obviously talking about the mystery that shrouds his death and the days before his death as well. And um, the, it's essentially the question that will never be answered. And I'm assuming that that has something to do with his lasting star power. Um, in your book, you talk about, um, I guess, the the perception of Poe in popular culture, um, it's very different from the truth of the man. Um, the Poe in popular culture that exists is uh, sort of its own image, maybe even uh, a caricature. Um, and he even has like his own iconography. Um, we can see that in even uh, like programming and things like that aimed toward younger people, like the, the show that recently came out about Wednesday Adams. Um, a lot of that had to do with Poe and it, it sort of surprised me just how much he was injected into that show. Um, so obviously he's very popular. He endures um, not just his works, but the, um, the character that has been made of him. Um, and you have this great quote in your book that uh, is called a mix of fact and fancy, which I really loved. Um, so do you think considering how much his history, shall we say, uh, has been manipulated throughout history, whether it's just by admirers or, uh, foes like Griswold, was there an ethics that you felt like you had to maintain when writing about Poe? No, you know, I, I think that the image Rufus Griswold starts it with the misunderstanding. He sort of is the beginning, but we're all complicit in it. Yes. We're all complicit in it, including me, by the way. You know, this is my wife and I perform a two person show of poems and stories by Edgar Allan Poe. And we always open by telling people, well, Poe is this marvelously versatile writer. You know him as the master of the macabre. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know he was this 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 very versatile, careful, exacting writer who wrote all these different kinds of things, and he's not who you think he was. But we're doing the Raven tonight. <laughs> you know, we're going to perform the Cask of Amontillado. So we're as guilty of it as anybody. The 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 this really it, 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 the misunderstanding kind of starts with 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 Griswold. But the backlash to Griswold comes from the French. It comes from you know Baudelaire. And, and his circle were great admirers of Poe. But one of the things they did, they attacked Griswold. Boy, did they attack him. You know, <laughs> Baudelaire called Griswold a pedagogic vampire. And, uh, famously asked about, because he compares Griswold to a dog. He, he famously said, are, are there not ordinances in America that keep dogs from running through cemeteries? You know, oh, I mean, he just goes, I mean, but, Beautiful insults. They replaced one mythology with another because the French mm -hmm. sort of look at Poe as a reflection of his own unreliable narrators. And mm -hmm. they, they, they encourage people to sort of think of Poe as a mad genius, which is really selling him short. He, was, he wasn't. He was, 
the, the stereotype, the caricature that you referenced, and everybody you know, can sort of join in on this because if there's this kind of Rorschach test where you say Edgar Allan Poe, well, for the, what, everybody's gonna recognize, have, a, have an image of who that is, mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing for a writer who died in 1849, you know? But he's gonna be the guy who's staring at you from t-shirts and coffee mugs and, and, and ties and lapel pins and all the way we market and merchandise Poe. Yeah. And if you sort of get this, this, what is the caricature? Well, the caricature is this sickly, hollow-eyed, pale guy up in an attic, surrounded by cobwebs, a raven perched on his shoulder as he's huddled over a manuscript, a <laughs> bottle of cognac in easy reach, and a red-eyed black cat prowling amongst the cobwebs as he spins out these fever dream stories probably fueled by drugs and alcohol. And none of that's true. There's no part of that that's true. <laughs> but that is the caricature we've made of him. Mm -hmm. And and again, fame has been a double-edged sword for Poe. And on the one hand, we remember him, but we remember him for a very small group of stories and poems. And most of them fall on what I would call the spooky side of the street. Now that's wonderful, you know. Poe himself probably would be delighted to know he was still remembered and that his fame has outlasted all those people who were supposed <laughs> to outlive him. He is probably like, you know, where's Longfellow today? Where's Emerson today? Ha ha, they know me. They're, they're putting my picture on t-shirts, ha ha. But, but I think he'd be appalled to know that we reduced him to being basically the grandfather of goth, I think he would be just with like, like, well, yeah, I was good at that, but I, I there were so many other arrows in my quiver. What, why have I been reduced to that? Yeah, you know, and and the answer is because we've done that. You know, branding of an author is a 20th century American conceit. You know, what kind of writer are you? You know, now, 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 Jordan, you're you're studying Gothic literature and you're studying, you know, the roots and all this. You know this. But if you had said to any of the great people who who propelled horror and Gothic fiction in the in the 1800s, Mary Shelley, Edgar Allan Poe, Robert Louis Stevenson, Bram Stoker, that's pretty much a Mount Rushmore of, of, of them. And if you had said to any of them, you're a horror writer, they wouldn't have known what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. They would have said... Gothic? You, you, are you saying I write Gothic? Well, maybe today I am, you know, but in Stevenson's case, he would have said, yeah, I, I am writing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde today, but tomorrow I'm writing Treasure Island. And the next day I'm writing A Child's Garden of Verses. And the next day I'm working on essays. That's how Poe would have viewed himself. Poe viewed himself as a writer, you, you know, not as, as a sort of a brand. We've made the brand. We've created the brand. And yeah. That has reduced, I and mean, that is one of the, the the aims of the book is to sort of break that all off. And we don't lose the the fun Poe, the Gothic Poe, mm -hmm. if we expand our view of him. You know, if you if you go if you start go back into a time machine and you and we say, okay, it's 1960, and at the at the dawn of that amazing decade when everything got turned upside down and inside out, and all our perceptions. If you look at Mark Twain and Edgar Allan Poe. They were the two universally recognized American authors that you could show people a picture of them. I mean, I mean, how many people could pick Herman Melville out of a police lineup for crying out loud? You know, yeah. how many people would recognize Emerson or people instantly recognize Twain and Poe? But 1960, both of them, their reputations are somewhat based on stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Twain is the genial family author. He's the grandfatherly man of letters. He's a boy's author. Poe is the, the master of the macabre. He is, you know, our, 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 that era is, his era is Stephen King. He is the headwaters of all things spooky and mysterious. Now, as you go through the 60s, Twain's suppressed writings come out and we expand our view of Twain. We now accept Twain as this great social critic and the darker writings that he did. We never lost the other Twain because of that, because we enlarged our view. Poe comes out of the 60s, the same guy he went in. He's every bit as popular at the end of the 60s, 
but he's still just the horror guy. He's still just the, oh, this is the guy who wrote the Telltale Heart and the Raven. So you, you, in order to understand Poe, in order to understand the guy who actually wrote those stories, the caricature doesn't work. You have to go to the real writer to understand why he was so good at writing those stories that we love so much. And that's one of the aims of the book. I like that. Um, you talk about this a little bit in your book, and I think this sort of uh, ties into what you were just saying about uh, everyone's own personal idea of who Poe is. Um, and I think at least mine and maybe other people can relate to this, the, um, the very first uh, work of Poe that I was um, exposed to sort of um, set the tone for how I think about him now, um, because I can still vividly remember the first text I ever read of his was The Telltale Heart, and it was in seventh grade in school. Um, and it was obviously so much more interesting than the other things that we were doing. So it stuck out. And then we also did the Cask of Amontillado, uh, two texts, which you don't really think about um, introducing to seventh graders, maybe. And whenever I was working on my um, senior project back in undergrad on Poe, I reached out to Neil Gaiman and I asked him, what was the first Poe text you were ever exposed to? And he said, the hot frog. So what is what was the first Poe text that you ever read? I'm not sure. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You know, nobody's ever asked that question before. And I discovered Poe earlier. Now, most people, like you said, get Poe around the seventh grade the first time. He's, he enters into curriculum in the seventh grade, which is great. But, but marvelous age to get. <laughs> and uh, but I started because I became a horror fan at the age of seven. I actually sought out Poe before that. And I had two <laughs> scholastic books. Remember the scholastic catalog that used to be delivered to you? Yes. And uh, there were two uh, collections of Poe, 10 Tales of Mystery and eight Tales of Horror that from Scholastic. Those stories were the, uh, the telltale heart of it, if you will, because I, I know in those collections was the Cask of Amontillado. I know in that collection was uh, the Purloined Letter and the Black Cat and the Mask of the Red Death. Um, so they're all together, really. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't tell you which was the first I, I, I read and which one. It, collectively, those 18 tales had a tremendous uh, impact on me. So, but as, as to which one checked in first, I'm not sure, I, 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 I forensically can't do that, uh, go back. But you, you but I, you, you, your experience is one of the great things about Poe. Poe is our renewable literary resource. And it's because he keeps getting reintroduced in curriculum. Everybody gets Poe in the seventh grade. And then they continue to get him in throughout junior high school, high school, and then on into college if you take basic English courses. So he's, he's there. He, he's, he's never dropped out of curriculum on any level. And the, the beauty part of it is seventh grade. That's the greedy part of it because it's so, it's so subversive. Anybody else, we would be objecting to this. You're giving seventh graders what? <laughs> You're giving him some stories where he's dismembering corpses and walling up people in catacombs and putting them in torture chambers? <laughs> you, you can't do that. And nobody lifts an eye of brow about this. Yeah, nobody no. says a word. And it's a great thing to give uh, seventh graders because at that age, for most seventh grading, writing is a ch reading is a chore. Oh, we're reading. Oh, you know, nobody, you know, at that age, nobody, there's very few. You know, there's one or two students who like to read, but almost the, the vast majority of them reading is just a, a bloody chore. <laughs> and, and now we're going to turn it into an actual bloody chore because we're going to give you the telltale heart and we're mm -hmm. going to give you uh, the cask of Amontillado and we're going to give you the pit and the pendulum. And what a great age it is to get that because all of a sudden, you know, kids love getting Poe in the sun. It's like a teacher after teacher has told me this is, is they just love it because you're, it, what a great thing to fire up your imagination at that age. Mm -hmm. and, and also to be excited about reading. This is reading. 
Really? I, up to now, I hadn't realized reading could be this much fun. And mm -hmm. teachers love teaching, Poe. It's not just that the kids like reading it. They adore te teaching it as well. So Poe constantly gets, I can't tell you how many people, when I, they learned I was writing about Poe, shared something like you just shared. And it might've been something like, oh, I, I, I had to memorize the first five stanzas of The Raven and when I was in, and then they'll insist on doing it, by the way. Those are, <laughs> I can still do it. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, and then they're off and I've got a living. A very good <laughs> you know, it's, it's wonderful though, but part of me is just giggling with delight because what other author can, do, can you do that with? Mm -hmm. What other author can you do that where there, there's that many um, memories that are attached to it and fond memories? And then people carry Poe through their life and they continue to, 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 to carry him through. So I, I'm, I'm delighted. I wish people, you know, like I said, another thing people would often say to me when they found out that I was writing about Poe was, oh, I love Poe. I've read everything he's written. And then they said that. <laughs> And I never said it. I never, I never once challenged it. Never is that would be churlish. So I wouldn't do that. But in the back of my mind, I was thinking, really? You've read all 17 volumes, have you? Because Poe, he only lived to be 40, but he lived long enough to fill 17 volumes of his collected works. And very little of it is actually the horror stories or the mm -hmm. or the, the spooky poems. In his lifetime, and you know this, but in Poe's lifetime, he wasn't even best known as a short story writer. He was best known as a critic. He was best known as a literary critic and a very fierce and exacting one. He was so well known as a critic, his nickname was the Tomahawk Man. And he believed that American literature would never grow up, would never find its own voice, would never escape the long shadow of Europe, unless it was subjected to this kind of strict criticism. And Poe is a good critic. He was really good. Uh, his judgments are sound. The people he basically said should be remembered, we remember. The people, the, the trash he dismissed, and that was a lot, has, 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 has died away and, des and deserved to, be, to die away. So Poe was known first as a critic in his lifetime, then as a poet, then as a short story writer. Our time has reversed that order. And now we know him first as a short story writer, second as a poet. And if you know it, that he was a critic, then you know that. Mm -hmm. That's funny that you just said that because uh, it also reminds me of the, him being remembered first by his death and then afterward by his life. Um, it's all very inverted when mm -hmm. it comes to him. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, something that I really, really uh, liked was uh, the photographs that you included in your book. They were um, amazing, and there were portraits done of Poe in the 1840s, like spanning the 1840s. Um, and some of those I had never seen before, and they looked much different than the most famous daguerreotype that's usually used of him in popular memorabilia. So in a way, seeing these new portraits of him reconceptualized the way that I had thought of him. So were there any of your own beliefs or perspectives regarding Poe challenged while you researched and wrote this book? Only heightened, not not so much challenged because I I had sort of come to the to me the the, the real revelation revelation because I have been reading about Poe uh, of most of my adult life so I was aware that he was not who we imagined him to be mm -hmm. what the what the, the scholarship on Poe really starts about eighty years ago with uh, the Quinn biography which is a landmark biography which was a massive effort to set the record straight. And the 80 years since has been an ongoing attempt to untangle this very twisted record of, about Poe. So I was aware of that. I was, I was aware of all that. But what really kind of drove it home, and I, I, you'll kind of like this, is that it really came from my day job as um, a TV and film critic for, for many years. And during that time, I ended up um, interviewing a lot of horror writers, directors, and actors. And I invariably ended up talking to them, people like Vincent Price and Stephen King and Anne Rice and Ray Bradbury and Wes Craven. And I ended up talking to them about Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. And it was their insights 
people who actually did what we credit Poe with turning into an art form was Ray Bradbury said, Poe took the horror story and he made literature out of it. Oh boy, did he. That's, that's as good a, a, a description of Poe's ach achievement as I've ever heard. <laughs> and Ray Bradbury was a smart guy. And it, it was through their insights of him that I really started to get a better fix on the real Poe because they were doing it. They knew what it took to do that. Mm -hmm. And the first thing it takes was the first thing we've always denied Poe, which is a sense of humor. We never think of Poe as smiling mm -hmm. or, but, but Poe wrote as much humor as he did horror. He wrote satire, hoaxes. He was a funny guy. He was witty, he was funny. We just don't have any pictures of him smiling or laughing because the daguerreotypes, and we've only got eight daguerreotypes of Poe, images of Poe, and they're all from the last six years of his life. So we, and, and even the portraits that we have of Poe all come from the last six years of his life. Mm -hmm. So we only have, you know, 10 or 11 images of Poe that are authentic images that all of our perception of Poe comes from, and the vast majority of them are from the last two years of his life. Those images are when he's starting to really fall apart. He looks sickly. He, it fits the stereotype again. Those images have, have reinforced the stereotype about mm -hmm. Poe. But it, it, Poe only grew the mustache in the last two or three years of his life. It's like Twain in the white suit. We always think of Twain in the, that, that white suit, but he, he didn't really start wearing the white suit until the very end. Mm -hmm. Poe didn't grow the mustache until the very end. Yeah. So if you passed Poe on the streets of New York or Philadelphia in the early 1840s, you probably wouldn't have recognized him. Mm -hmm. Not only would he have not had a mustache, he would have had long sideburns. He would have looked very healthy because he walked all the time. He walked with a very brisk military gait. Um, again, all the ways we do not think of Poe. But one of the first things that every horror writer told me and every phrase was that, you need a sense of humor in order to write horror. If you do not have a sense of humor, you will go crazy. You have to have a sense of humor to keep your perspective as a, as a horror writer. And every person I ever interviewed who did horror had great senses of humor. They were very funny people. And they all said the same thing about Poe. He was very funny. He's even very funny in the horror stories. Yes. There are moments in the horror stories which are drop down funny. And, uh, and, and we don't credit him with that. And that's the first thing we should credit him with is having a sense of humor. No, I agree. I was going to say the same thing that some of his stories are so ridiculous that they are very funny. Well, they were, and they were written as satires of horrors. We, we accept like um, uh, the case of Monsieur Voldemar or the system of Dr. Tar and Dr. Feather. Some of those, those stories, which were clearly meant to be satires on, on, on the horror stories have been included in serious horror. <laughs> like Poe would be love that. That would be a great joke to him. Is that there that was taken seriously? Um. So as I was going through your writing, which I really, really enjoyed, by the way, because it it sort of it married uh what I saw as like um uh, creative writing in a way with scholarship, and you hit all these little Easter eggs um, and references to Poe, which I really enjoyed trying to pick up as I was reading, um, such as calling like the last few years of his life a descent into the maelstrom. I really enjoyed that. Which was your favorite chapter to write or which was, I guess, maybe the most memorable while this was going on? Oh, well, I, I, I like the, uh, the flashback chapters that, uh, there's, a, there's a dual narrative, a, a dual timeline to, to the book, you know, because when we had decided on uh, what the book was going to be, uh, when I say we, I'm talking about, you know, this always goes back to conversations with an editor, you know, so I had this uh, conversation with an editor at St. Martin's, and that's how the whole idea of the book came about, you know, and he was the one who first suggested a book about uh, the Edgar Allan Poe, and I very quickly got the idea, he, he wanted a book about Edgar Allan Poe's death, mm -hmm. and then I started to throw up red flags and say, whoa, 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 you are not seriously suggesting we write a book that conclusively proves how Edgar Allan Poe died, are you? You know, we're not going to write one of those books that seem to show up every two years claiming they've solved the mystery of who Jack the Ripper is, are <laughs> yes. you? 
Uh, I said, because look, I said, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's, let's just say it. There was no autopsy. And had there been an autopsy, it would have been worthless because the art of the autopsy did not really come of age until the Civil War. And they would have been conducted with the equivalence of, of butcher's knives. So even if there had been an autopsy, it probably would have been worthless. They wouldn't know what they were looking for or how to go about it. There was no death certificate. There's no surviving soft tissue that can be subjected to modern forensic testing. The witnesses that do exist are highly unreliable mm -hmm. if, and they contradict each other. I said, so this is a cold case. This is a cold case. And if that's the book you want me to write, go find yourself another lunatic because this <laughs> one's driving away. And uh, I said, but I'll tell you what I will write. I will write a book about Poe's life and use his death as the prism through which we will examine his life. Uh, and he liked that idea. So I came up with the idea of a, uh, two timelines, uh, one timeline following him through the desperate last months of his life and the other flashbacking to various periods of his life until the two timelines meet. And I said, if I can come up with a, what I think is a compelling, logical and uh, convincing reason for why he died, um, I will present it. But I am not going to insist on it. And I'm also not going to claim it can, I can prove it. I, I'm not gonna go, that would be irresponsible and I'm not gonna go that far. Um, whatever you know, Poe died of, we are beyond being able to prove it conclusively, one way or the other. And, uh, and I would never claim that uh, this book comes up with a definitive conclusive answer. I think it comes up with an answer and I like my answer. Um, but I'm not, uh, but again, I would not insist that if somebody came up to me and said, I think it's this, fine. You know, uh, I think Poe himself would love that. But, you know, I did want to take chances with this book. And one of the things I, I, I took, I, I, and I knew I was leading with my chin on this, but I didn't want to write a, um, a traditional biography of Poe. Um, mm -hmm. There've been enough of them. And, and they're very good. I, I didn't, I, that sounded dismissive. I, I apologize because I've got a lot of them and I admire most of them. So, um, I, I, but we didn't need another traditional biography of Poe. I wanted to write a popular biography of Poe. This is not a scholarly, it's not an attempt to write a scholarly definitive, by, there are better people for that. There, there better be better people for that. So I, I you know, I, I have not, I do not pretend to be a scholar. I do not pretend to be uh, an academic in the true sense of the word. Every once in a while, somebody will refer to me as a Twain scholar. And part of me shrivels a little bit when they say that because it, it you know, I, I've never earned that title and I don't claim to it. I'm a writer, you know, and I approach this as a writer, looking at a writer, trying to solve the creative process. That's what fascinates me, the creative process. Um, and like I said, the, the caricature never made sense. What does make sense is the reality of Poe. And then when you put that all together, it's aha, this had to be the guy who wrote those stories. Mm -hmm. Has to be. So, um, you know, that we, we went through this and I, I said, and another way I took chances on this book was I did interviews. Mm -hmm. How do you do interviews for a life of somebody that ended in 1849? Mm -hmm. There are no, nobody's alive who knew him. Nobody alive who knows anybody who knew him. This is so far removed. I decided that um, I was not going, I, I can't pretend to be a different type of writer. Now I spent 43 years as a journalist. So I set out doing interviews and I talked to various post scholars, uh, leading post scholars who have specialized in various aspects of his life and his writing. And I talked to medical historians, uh, forensic pathologists, forensic archeologists, uh, an FBI agent, uh, cri uh, true crime writers, all those horror people I talked about. These were my witnesses. These were my experts. I sort of viewed this as a detective on the case and I have to interview experts about various aspects of Poe's life to come up with answers. So uh, I, I, I did interviews for this so I could have voices going throughout the book, lively. And I encouraged all of them to speak as candidly as possible, I said, don't try to sound important. Don't try to sound like academic. <laughs> I would say it like you would just say it. 
Yeah. Just say it. And they all did. And I think that's some of the gold in the book is some of the way, some of the things they said about Poe was said in such a wonderfully down to earth way. And mm -hmm. as soon as they said something like that in the back of my mind, I said, that's gold. That's going in the book. That's going in the book. So um, that's a chance too. And I knew that that's a chance. I know a lot of people are going to, would, would say, well, what's with all the interviews? Well, I'll fall back on something Stephen King said when uh, about his own writing and said, if you object to the type of writing I do, if you object to the type of writer I am and, and, and the, the writing that falls on the horror or terror side of the street, all I can tell you is it's what I have. And that's what I would say about this book. It, it, it's, I, I couldn't pretend to be a different type of writer. So I did sort of use the technique of the journalist or the documentarian, if you will, mm -hmm. in using these voices. And some people are not going to like, I, I knew that. I knew that, when, again, when I put it out there, that the dual timeline and that were, were, was, was somewhat going off the high diving board, not knowing whether there was water in the pool or not. Mm -hmm. you know, but that, I don't think Poe deserves something which takes a chance. You know, I don't think. Poe himself would have admired just another biography which said, let's just march through his life A to Z. <laughs> uh, yeah, I really enjoyed all the um, interviews with scholars and um, professionals and whatnot. It felt like an ongoing dialogue. And mm -hmm. that's not something that you can always get, like you said, with a figure that died so long ago. Um, there is a quote that I found by V.S. Pritchett um, mm -hmm. that I thought was particularly relevant. Uh, I'm sure some of you already know what I'm about to say, but of uh, Poe and Mark Twain, uh, Pritchett declared that, quote, everything really American, really non-English comes out of that pair of spiritual, spiritual derelicts, those two scarecrow figures with their half-lynched minds. <laughs> so I, I thought that was wonderful and it spoke to um, I won't put that on Twain. You can speak to that, but Poe's legacy and oh, I, I no, I, I think it's accurate. I, I think yeah. that you know, and I, I think it's interesting that we remember them as sort of black and white. <laughs> you know, is, is, is Twain always in white? You know, always in the Poe always in black. Yes. You know, but I agree. I think you know, uh, American literature. I think they're the one-two punch that sort of does set it free. You know, William Dean Howells uh, famously said of Twain that he was the Lincoln of our literature, that he set, set it free. And uh, I, I think in some ways, Poe is calling for Twain when his, in his criticism. If you read Poe's criticism, he's waiting for somebody who's going to write in the vernacular, write in, the, write in a way which is, uh, which is not going to kneel down to Europe in general and England in particular. And Twain's the fulfillment of that. You know, is 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 sort of like uh, Poe is, the, is John the Baptist in the desert, calling out for you know, let's get where where is the Messiah? You know, and here comes that's a little sacrilegious, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but but it is it's it, it, it's it's true that that I I, I think Poe in some ways it, it 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 he has his own genius and he has and he has his own effect on everything he does, but he's also the critic. He is and and that's where the Poe that one of the uh, the Poe that's gotten lost. You know, somebody, I can't remember which Poe scholar said this, but they said like, everybody wants Poe playing on their team. You know, the horror people want him, the mystery people want him, even the science fiction people want him uh, on their team. And there've even been collections of his humor that have been done. But the one group of people that have never quite claimed him and should, and George Bernard Shaw said this, are the critics, is that Poe was, he was in some ways the first modern critic. Mm -hmm. And he set the standard, and 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 Shaw recognized because Shaw was a Shaw was a critic as well as being a playwright, and and Shaw recognized that as well. So, yeah, I I agree with that. I I, I think you know I, th I think they are the one-two punch. Yeah. So I know Omar will uh, open to questions in a minute, so I'll just have one like last question to close our discussion. Um. So you talk about the mistake of consigning Poe strictly to death. Um. How do you think we can invite life back into his legacy? Well, I, I think understanding the artist is, is, is the great thing is that, you know, one thing that um, 
has hung over Poe's lifetime. And, he, and this is self-inflicted, by the way. A lot of damage to Poe is self-inflicted because he was, um, he, was, he was not reliable in giving his own biography. He twisted the, the facts. And you know, Poe also, uh, he was, so he wrote a, a short story called The Imp of the Perverse. Poe had the imp of the perverse. He always does the worst thing at the worst possible time. And if you want to start a debate among Poe scholars, bring up the subject of alcohol. You know, how much of a problem was this for Poe? How much did he drink? Mm -hmm. um, it's clear Poe is allergic to alcohol. It's clear, you know, from the record, from the first point he takes a drink at the University of Virginia, he's he's immediately drunk on this first glass of, of wine. He 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 would. He didn't savor it. He didn't sip it. He threw it back. And as soon as it was, he, it, it hit him, he was like he had been drinking for hours. And then he, it's a long time recovery. It wasn't just a morning hangover. He took days to recover from, from, from Bassett. So I think we think of Poe as being perpetually drunk, that he mm -hmm. was. And, 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 but there were these long periods of sobriety. You, you can't write that much, enough to fill 17 volumes of that high quality on all those things. And remember, Poe was a very careful writer. He was mm -hmm. constantly revising his work. He was constantly searching for precisely the word. He was a very careful craftsman and a very skilled one. That's how we can honor Poe. That's the answer to your question is, is to, okay, you know, uh, Let's all have fun, you know. I have a Poe action figure, like like you know, a lot of people. I Poe plushies, you know. I'm just, we can still have fun with this guy. He did. He had fun with it when the Raven hit, and all of a sudden he's got his little a uh, taste of celebrity for the first time. He he goes out dressed in black, and the and the the neighborhood kids in New York follow him and throw pebbles at his heels, and he's he's known as the Raven Man. And, and he waits for them to get just close enough and he wheels around and he says, never more. And they go, Grah! they all go screaming into the, into the night. He loved that. He was playing up to it. You know, mm -hmm. the way Stephen King sort of plays into the, uh, uh, but we, we accept that Stephen behind that Stephen King is a down to earth guy, a family guy, a guy you know, again, what, what I've always sort of, I think people are sometimes afraid of losing that Poe and we're not mm -hmm. going to lose him. We can't. It's impossible to lose that Poe. He was too good at it. He was just way too good to, to ever lose that Poe. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much uh, for having this conversation with me. Uh, I very much enjoyed it. I enjoyed your book so much. Um, I read it front to back in one sitting. Um, so congratulations on your book. Well, thank too, you. By the way. And yeah, thank you. No, no, thank you. The questions were wonderful. Thank you. And we have a bunch of questions here from our audience. Okay. Um, one question um, that I'd like to know, because I do work at the Twain House, but I'm not a Twain scholar. I mean, neither are you, Mark, but you might know this answer. Uh, did Twain read Poe? Yes, yes. And he had a dual, uh, again, it's never, there's always a duality, right? Um, is he didn't much care for, for Poe's prose. Uh, he liked the poetry, uh, but he was he wasn't that 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 crazy about because because Poe's language is was very dense. You know, he used and and Twain comes along and he's going to really set American literature free and and, and emphasize things like the vernacular. So he he wasn't uh, as crazy, but he wasn't as critical of Poe as he was some other. He hated James Fenimore Cooper. Right? If you want to sort of look at his targets, you know. James Fenimore Cooper, Sir Walter Scott, and, and Jane Austen are the big three that he yes. took. Yeah. And he once said that Poe's, Poe's prose was unreadable. Um, he's, and he's, then he said, like Jane Austen's. Um, he said, no, I'll tell you the day that I, I would read uh, Poe on salary, but I, wouldn't, I couldn't read Jane Austen's stuff on salary. So, you yeah. <laughs> know, he really had it in for her those three so he 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 gave poe high marks as a as a poet but not so much as as, as a prose writer yeah we, we do talk about that uh, we do talk about uh twain's hate of jane austen at the museum and how ironic it is uh given that you know she was humorous in 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 her own way you know I've always, i have a theory about that i don't want to burn up too much time on that but i i, I actually think 
he was surrounded by people who loved Jane Austen. Yes. William Dean yes. Howells, all of his friends loved Jane Austen. I yeah. think he was sort of, you know, how you're you're the one person in high school who doesn't yeah. read Tolkien and everybody else reads Tolkien and they're, they're sort of yeah. jamming it down your throat. So you take the, the opposite. I think yeah. there was a bit of that in that. I think he was, he was having, having his hipster moment. Yeah, um, I agree. Not liking agree. the mainstream. Um, and of course, this came up. I'm sure you've heard, you've had this question before. Um, well, um, someone asked if Poe went to West Point, and I believe he did. He did. Um, but they make a few people have made references to the Pale Blue Eye, which uh, a, a movie about Poe that came out recently. Um, anything that you have to say about that movie, <laughs> or even you, Jordan? If no, you saw I, it, Jordan, you go first. I have not seen it. I haven't even heard of that film actually so i'm getting a surprise now yeah <laughs> uh, the pale blue eye is a uh, mystery story set around poe's time at west point he is sort of a secondary character in it um but um it portrayed much more true to who he was at the time very you know the the, the portrayal of poe for the first time if you look at poe's portrayal on screen uh, they always present him as the stereotype he's always you know he's never this is the one of the first films regardless of what anybody would think of it as a quality uh, mystery story, uh, it, it is at least a, an attempt to get Poe right. You know, and he's only at West Point for a few months, by the way. He's, he, he gets there and he very quickly realizes that John Allen, his foster father, isn't gonna give him enough money to support being a student at West Point. And also the rigors of I mean, West Point today is, 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 is no picnic, obviously, for, uh, but back then you couldn't even play cards or read books at night. You, those were forbidden. There were all these rules at, uh, as far as this was a spartaning uh, existence. And during this time, one of the, the, the few things Poe mastered at West Point was the ability to sneak off ca campus and go to a neighborhood tavern and bring back uh, alcohol for the other students. Um, he and his, his, his roommate, they became very, one would be the lookout and the other would be the runner to go get the, the and, and, and from this came, it came a, a, a delicious prank they played on the other cadets, which, you know, I'm not going to reveal, you know, this is kind of read the book, but it shows Poe's sense of humor too. It shows his, his wonderful sense of humor. Yes, I, I watched the movie and I really liked the, um, the representation of Poe was so different from what you've seen before. This frantic person who had was very humorous and would uh, regale his his buddies with limericks. So. Yeah. Yeah. The, the limericks about the professors, about the you know satirical <laughs> lyrics about their professors. They loved it. You know, they they thought he was, yeah. he was great, and he would draw on the walls. He was an artist, and you know, so you, you know there was this kind of other Poe that you know we we need to recognize so yeah um julie is asking you said you have read many of the poll biographies which do you recommend no well 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 this one's awfully good yeah. <laughs> you know uh, um and I, but i won't dodge the question in, in some ways nobody has ever done better than the original uh, the quinn biography which was published about uh, 1940 and uh, Arthur Quinn's biography still stands as kind of the monumental. It's a little tough to read today, though. Uh, it's written in a very academic, and not only just an academic style, but a 1940 academic style. So it's a little dense and it's a little hard. But if you just wanted a really uh, readable biography and a rel fairly reliable one, I think the best written is uh, Julian Simmons' The Telltale Heart. Um, it's a gorgeous book. And, and I would, uh, James Hutchison's A Poe uh, biography. Uh, the reason I like both of them is they're both very well written. They're both exceptionally well written. Julian Simmons was a mystery writer and a biographer on top of being a Poe scholar. He, he, there's been a lot of scholarship which has uh, occurred since that book was was published around 1980. Uh, Poe scholarship has moved, you know, a little bit, but I still think it's a it's a it's a it's a pretty wonderful biography. Awesome. Um, John wants to know uh, what is your favorite. Poe short story and why? The Cask of Amontillado. <laughs> <laughs> I, Sarah and I perform, my wife Sarah Showman uh, is, is a wonderful actress and, and I, we perform several Poe pieces. Uh, but The Cask of Amontillado uh, is, is, it's what is what, it's his last major short story. 
It's it's it's, it's written in the last. You know, Poe has this this like two year period in the last two year where there's, it's it's the only fallow period of his life, and then there's this blooming. There's this return to poetry at the end where he writes the bells and Annabelle Lee and El Dorado, and then he also writes Hop Frog and the Cask of Amontillado at the very end. So there's this kind of re, this 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 renaissance at the very end when he's he's at his most sickly, and the Cask of Amontillado is. Um, it's a very funny story, in addition to being a very horrific story, because you have this whole dance where Montresor is, 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 is luring Fortunato into the catacombs. And he keeps saying, oh, let's go back. You know, your, your health is precious. You know, and I can't be responsible. And he keeps drawing him in. And there's one point where uh, Fortunato has a coughing fit. And Montresor says, once again, let's let's go back your cough and fortunato says the cough is nothing it's merely nothing i i shall not die of a cough you can almost hear the pause at this moment you can almost hear and the only thing that montresor says is true and you know he's about to wall this guy up and he's he keeps telling him to go back he keeps giving him chase he's he's toying with him the whole time well, when Sarah and I do that, and I hit that word true, the audience falls down laughing. And it is a very funny moment. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tremendously funny moment. So that's, that's, that's my favorite among the favorites. Let me put it that way, because I love the Mask of the Red Death, and I love the Telltale Heart, and I love, you know, but the favorite among the favorites, I, if, if, you, if, you, if you had to, if I had to pick one, I, I would pick the Cask of Amontillado. And and John insists that uh, for you to talk about the Montresor coat of arms. <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> which is a, uh, um, a a human heel with a serpent's fangs embedded in the heel, and he says, and, and, and what is the motto? And he gives them the motto in Latin, and the and he asks for the translation. Montresor says, you know, nobody injures me with impunity. And Fortunato says, good, that's a good motto. I like that. <laughs> that's wonderful. That is just wonderful. And again, you know, Poe's having, and you know, Poe had so many enemies. He made so many enemies. You also want to ask him, who are you walling up, Eddie? You know, who did you have in mind in that story? <laughs> I, I think I know, by the way, if, 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 I, I think it was Thomas Dunn English, who he was another a writer who he had a feud with. So and, and I, I, if, if I had to guess, but that might be simplistic, too. <laughs> Writers always have someone in mind for a character. <laughs> um by the way i i i i love the um the mask of the red death but that, that sarah does. you know when we perform that's sarah changed does. since the pandemic <laughs> sarah's performed the mask of the red death uh so, and we've done that for many years and she's 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 the real actor in the family by far she's you know i, I i'm i always say when we we perform poe or anything and it's just the two of us i've got the best seat in the house and uh but she, she does the mask of the red death and it's it's gorgeous with the way she does it. It's got my favorite line. Mask of the Red Death is my favorite line. Uh, it, 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 this was just posted among Poe scholars. Everybody was asked to name their famous favorite line from Poe. And I, I, it's at the end. It's, and now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night. If that doesn't send the chills up the back of your neck, you know, uh, I don't know what will. That's my, fa that's my favorite Poe line. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we have so many more questions and we're, we've reached the end of our time. Um, but thanks so much to you, Mark and Jordan. Um, I wish we could keep here. going on this. I'm, I'm, oh, yeah, absolutely. We could, we could keep going. I would take all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> you know me, I'll wear you out. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll have a good time. <laughs> Um, so if you want to buy Mark's book, you can do so through our museum store. Um, I put a link in the chat, um, but you can just go to our website, click on shop, um, and then event books, I think books and then event books, and, and you'll find it there. Um, and um, you can also join us for other future free virtual programs. 
Um, we have a really cool uh, program coming up in April, on April 11th. It's not on the website yet, but I want to let you know. Um, it's uh, with an author, uh, Susan Wells, who will discuss her new book, uh, An Assassin in Utopia, The True Story of a 19th Century Sex Cult and a President's Murder. <laughs> Um, so if that title doesn't grab you, then, you know, um, so I hope you can join us for that. Um, and it'll be on the website soon. Thanks again so much, Jordan. And thanks again so much, Mark and, and to you. Well, thank audience. you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, you know. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone.